our last panelist Mike. for the day. Mike. I'd like to invite to the stage our final panelists, um, Anne Crefting and Wayne Kynes. <coughs> There will be one more panel, so I'm mistaken. Uh, is Wayne not in the room? We can, we can start with Anne. Okay. Is there a name tag? Okay. There we go. It comes wherever you are. All right. Anne Crefting. And we're going to hear about Knowledge Factory, a community-based approach model for innovation in urban development. Anne graduated from Art and Anglistics, University Duisburg Essen. Is that how you pronounce it? Okay. She holds a doctorate in aesthetic and communication and is a certified systemic coach. European Training Academy in Vienna. She's a researcher and educator uh, in the field of material culture and design theory. And Anne worked in museum design and communication in the University of Cologne and was former dean of the Faculty of Applied Science and Art at the German University in Cairo. All right, and the floor is yours, please. Technical help? Technical help? Can we have technical help here, please? All right, just a second. because uh, Alex Library is a knowledge factory already. And this conference itself is a knowledge factory as well. And what I would like to add today is some thoughts on how we can use cultural processes and cultural mechanisms as mechanisms of research as well as urban and social development. So. I'm going to have four assumptions. First of all, is innovation is a female feature. The second one is that urban planning is about interaction. The third one is that creative economy is a driver for urban development. And the last one is that knowledge factory is a process problem. So, 
what you can find in research, not done by women, but by men recently, is focusing on what are female values. So it starts a shift, which is very interesting, where not only women are interested in rights, but where society and where men and we all together get interested in sort of which are the values and mechanisms that make a change, which is necessary to adapt to the changes which are on global. So Gethsema and D'Antonio in the book The Athena Doctrine, the Athena Doctrine wrote, I just have to have one minute, so. Values that underpin a new generation of innovation are based on connection and creativity. Many of the values that society was increasingly favoring, such as long-term thinking, passion, empathy, listening, communication, flexibility, agility, collaboration, transparency, openness, and humility are typically considered feminine. Funny enough, they continue, the most promising innovations of our time depend on exactly these feminine traits and values. From this point of view, an embrace of feminine qualities can be thought of as a competitive advantage, not unlike a breakthrough technology or a market insight. So, additionally, the concept of culture is often thought of as a, sort, as, a, as, a, as a soft benefit. But, and this also is from Gatsema and Antonio, where innovation, problem solving and creativity are the marks of growing business, the strong culture is the foundation beneath them. So this means innovation, creativity and culture, and culture not only meant as the way you think, act and interact, but also the roots of our culture and the cultural background have a strong impact on social development, on economic development, as well as personal growth. The point, too, is about urban planning. What does this mean? If architecture... No. I've, it's a quote, it's by an architect, um, Francis Curry. Architecture is about people, is what he's saying. If we consider architecture as buildings, we are somehow outdated. And this means, what he's saying is that architecture is about people, it means creating the ideal space, the ideal surroundings, is a way to allow people's ideas to flourish. So if we think architecture, urban planning, is about buildings, this is only part, one part of the, of the equation we have to take into consideration and come to completely different, different solutions if we think that it is about people. Another interesting um, um, architect is Isa Arida. He's a Lebanese-English-British uh, architect and he has been working on new concepts for architects and urban planning, which he calls urbanism and he calls himself an urban tech. So what he says is that birds' nests, like shelter, prehistoric caves, which deal with performing, temples, pyramids, which deal with memory as archiving systems, and places like the Sistine Chapel in Rome, which tell stories, are actually outdated. What actually architecture is, is memory in built form. Further, he says that every human is an architect, and that the paradigm has shifted, that architecture has changed, and actually architects are obsolete. What we are, as I mentioned, is sort of that we are urban techs. This means we are transdisciplinary expert for the new urban age. As he considers the quantum paradigm as very useful and uh, problem and so, uh, solution oriented for urban planning, he takes it like this. He says that any building is particle like. It has a physical shape that we can measure and pinpoint geographically. 
We can even describe its heights, materials, etc. All architects do that, all urban designers work with that aspect. But most of all, most buildings also have a wave life aspect that are more qualitative than quantitative. They have a function, a house, the parliament building, a school, a church, and this means they have a subjective meaning. So if we talk about architecture is about people, this means that people interact. This means architecture is about interaction. Further, he says, events also interact together to form new higher level particle wave events. Clusters of buildings thus form a neighborhood. It is particle-like, but it is, has also its own wave-like layers of meaning. It is my hood, the red light district, Chinatown, etc. And neighborhoods, furthermore, also interact together to create a city. Particle-like, but it is associated with many wave-like qualities, like the capital, where the jobs are, most romantic city on earth, and so on. So actually, if we look at urban planning, we are not only for we are not only facing facing structural problems, but we are fo focusing into we, we, we are um, um, we are facing we are facing a lot of interactional structures because events interact, neighborhoods interact, and this means we have a huge complexity of interaction which has a completely different perspective than thinking of it as sort of solid buildings which deliver structures and people fade into them. So what does, what does all that mean for urban development in rich ancient cultural heritage, like we find in Egypt? And I'm currently working in Upper Egypt, in Luxor and Aswan, with service design development, with urban planning, with uh, structural development in order to um, improve not only the economic situation but to improve the museum communication. If you consider Upper Egypt to be the biggest open air museum in the world, there's a lot of opportunities for jobs and for services is around this which are not yet met. So what does all this mean? We have a culture-rich environment. In Aswan, for instance, we have the natural environment, which is amazing, and we have a crossroad between the African and the Egyptian culture, reaching enormously back into the past. Oh, I think I'm pressing the wrong buttons. So, and the question then would be, how can we access and make use of ancient knowledge, which is stored in architecture and environment? Coming back to that, memory is architecture. Uh, uh, architecture is memory in built form. And memory in built form is rich potential for user experiences. So, and what is user experiences? This is what we call tourism, right? But not only that, also for locals, it's rich user experiences. So, this potential can be triggered and can be influenced. And there's knowledge about this in the OECD Creative Tourism Report from 2014, that creative economy is a contribution to, its, to this potential and a driver for urban development. Why? If people come nowadays, they want not only to see the sites, but they want to have activities around them. They want to experience them. There's a huge industry of creative tourism of people who want to come and live with people. They maybe want to learn something and so on. <coughs> Parallel, and this is another contribution, a male contribution, to something which would be considered a mere, more, more feminine value, and this is Erwin Laszlo and his colleague Dennis, who wrote a book in 2012, The New Science and Spirituality Reader. And they found out that actually the, 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 they consider that the 21st century is the meeting point where the wisdom of ancient traditions can find a synthesis with modern science. And we know this, there's enormously interesting connections between hieroglyphs and quantum mechanics and quantum physics, and this only as a hint. 
So if our historical past, in our historical past, our systems of knowledge were imbued with our spiritual gnosis, the delicate harmony has now gone out of balance because what we have been able to do with our scientific tools has outstripped the reflective processes of our spiritual understanding. And there's a tendency in societies all around the world to mend this and to make this match again, to make this work together again. So, if you think of Egypt, where else could be a better place to practice this, sort of the link between historical knowledge, between scientific knowledge and spiritual knowledge? And if we talk about creative industry and creative economy, where are we? So it's about heritage, it's about crafts, it's about traditional festivals, it's about cultural mm -hmm. science, it's about arts, visual, musical and performing, it's about creative business services like design, interior, software, and, 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 and it's about media, publishing, print, and so on. This means culture industry is culture economy and is closely related to driving and developing not only products in tourism but also to urban development because all these places need the, all these all these uh, topics need, need need places facilities services and so on so in this sense creative economy is an invitation for leading experts of scientific and humanistic cultures to engage in insightful inspiring conversation it can be a meeting of minds, like this conference is. It can be a bridge between science and spirituality. It can be conversations, seminars, symposia, and so on, that lead to a broader dialogue, substituting understanding for prejudice, making a meaningful contribution, and so on. And we heard a lot in the, uh, in the talks today about what kind of teaching and what kind of contributions for, for, for future knowledge this could be. So creative tourism, as part of this field, has been defined 2000 already by Richards and Raymonds um, as a tourism which offers visitors the opportunity to develop creative potential through active participation and learning experiences which are characteristic, characteristic for the holiday destination where they are taken. So if you think of this of Upper Egypt as an economic factor, as a cultural factor, um, the question would be how can we develop this and how can we supply this and how can we also make this a cultural activity which is at the same time a product in the market. And this is what Knowledge Factory is about. So, creative tourism thus is a place, and this is a definition of somebody who comes from learning labs in the Netherlands, who is developing new learning strategies, because the new future society needs new strategies of learning. Again, a creative tourism in this sense could be a place of inquiry and creation in an active effort to understand and form ourselves and the not yet sustainable world around us, to contribute to it with audacity and respect and to allow to grow, sorry, to grow in what makes us human, our creative potential for meaningful action. And if we consider this could be a concept of cultural tourism, this could be a concept of creative tourism, this could be a concept of a new learning in a global scale. What it would be needed is open space to do that. And a creative program. And with this we would have the particle and the wave. So, and it would be something like a living lab. This is what I've been preparing with students in, in Upper Egypt, in Luxor, and in, uh, in, in Aswan, is Aswan since last summer. And the outcome is this concept of a knowledge factory, which is designed as a living lab. And you know, living lab methodology is working with communities, with people, with complexity, and it's linking whatever needs to be linked, and, and technology as well, which makes it even more complex. 
So, um, again, the complex social, societal changes demand innovative ways of learning, living, and working together. And as I started off, this is a feminine, these are feminine values. So, how do we find programs and structures and uh, initiatives and people to set this into motion through learning programs. So Knowledge Factory thus focuses on building capacity for renewal in education and organizational learning for a resilient society and develop knowledge and approaches for social innovation. You see how these things are interlinked. As soon as you start uh, using the contact for learning programs, making them part of a market, and then sort of getting the knowledge which is created back into the society, which includes the communities, you get an enormous wave working, and sort of it's getting very dynamic. So it uses lab methodologies to explore and design transformational learning environments. And the question would be sort of well, why knowledge? Knowledge would mean continuous learning, improving the condition of human life, science, heritage, archaeology, anthropology, spirituality, architecture, and design, art, music, etc. Factory would mean that it's the center of producing knowledge. So, what does a factory do? As a center of knowledge, knowledge factory generates knowledge rooted in cultural heritage. It intends to inspire people and get inspired by them. It provides knowledge to fulfill human basic, basic human needs as spiritual, cultural, educational, and economic needs. It builds bridges between modernity and authenticity, past and present, faith and life, spiritual and scientific thinking. It involves experts from around the world to meet, study, and work for promoting knowledge that serves these needs. It turns knowledge into products that can be shared and disseminated in the knowledge economy and its services. You recognize this, Dr. Alia, sort of this was the result of one of our, con of our conversations, right? The students I'm working with currently, they're from architecture related to urban planning to, see our, to, to find out what is, uh, what would be a Nile culture-based architecture in Upper Egypt. Of course, you have a lot of models in the Nubian architecture, which is an enormous treasure for architects to find new solutions. Then we have um, um, commerce students who are interested in marketing, and they are dealing with crafts and crafts, <coughs> crafts marketing. And we are designing. We were thinking of slogans the other day. What could be knowledge factory slogans? And they came out with these ones: sort of come and learn by teaching something. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Or whatever was the science you're seeking, come and find it here. Or discover the artist in you. Or share learning experience. Or connect through disconnecting. Come and learn self-marketing. And maybe also to find out a traveler is different from a tourist. And this also could be all issues sort of that can be worked on. So if you think now of a Nile culture database, which would be the core of this, thinking of Aswan as the center between the north of Egypt and the further going African up Nile direction. So Nile culture database would something very suitable in the idea of maybe like Kultnet sort of could be, could supply such data, such a database. And then around this, there would be something like a teaching program, an event program, event workshop space, there would be communication space, there would be PR, there would be training programs, there would be a research program. Wow. Around this would be workshops and tours and seminars, there would be new services, there would be a net cafe, there would be a remote services, there would be ITC development, there would be urban planning and logistics, and there would be architecture development. So you can spread the circle more and more and more, and from this would generate new business models. Because if you work with tourists as, uh, or with travelers or with creative people as um, as customers or as clients, sort of, you can easily find out what is needed here, and wherever there is a need, there would be n n new ideas for generating new services, sort of, which would generate and which would go into business models. So it would be a big 
cooperation of a lot of things. You know, it would be if you think of it on as Aswan, you have Elephantine Island, which you have where you have living Nubian culture, it would be the Nubian Museum, it might be Human Foundation, it would be the Egyptian Tourism Authority to do the marketing. There's another Nile Museum which could cooperate in this. It could be Kultnat, which would cooperate and be the be the be the database, and it would be Aswan University for the Nile culture, architecture and urban design. And this would be a rotating circular structure which would work like an engine. Mm -hmm. um, the model of procedure would be sort of to start off with on-site demand and see sort of what actually do travelers like, what do they want, if it is about culture, tourism, development, sort of, and what do all the stakeholders need, sort of the communities, the locals, the small, the super -holiday. And then it would be also to ask about what would potential people like and sort of always mirror this back into the community and start talking to the community. So then it would be about uh, finding new ways sort of what is the potential inside and have something like a transformation lab. Uh, it would be mirroring the results, sort of communicating all the knowledge that has been gained about what people want and what are the ideas in the market. It would then be about prototyping solutions for the community and sort of uh, make a transfer and a test with the stakeholders and then stabilize it in a place like a knowledge factory. We could say sort of we offer this and make this city or this part of a city something like a learning center which is oriented on the place where it is on Nile culture knowledge. And then it could be an idea database further sort of I have to stop? Okay. So we said this before, it would how many how many times? Two minutes? Yeah. So it would be something like again a global camp for innovation. It could be something like a culture office, a cultural learning center, it could be a service learning center, a service research center, a database, a visitor center, traveler school place for symposium, service test up and a service center. And that's also an incubator for user-centered service development. So I just give you to stop uh, some idea what the what the area would be we were dealing with sort of uh, again it would be the idea of Kemet which is the old Nile culture around um, um, uh, the the today area of uh, Sudan and Egypt and it would be the place where Khnum wells and Khnum is the deity of creation itself which lives in the Nile between Elephantine and the first cataract. It would be the place, you know, where you can see how the water is bubbling. You could really dive in as well into the, the environment and the, the, the creation myth, which has come out long, long time before pharaonic history. You would find the archaeology and you would find the, the contemporary remnants of it. You would be able to, and this is what the research also does, how to include the community, get the knowledge which they have mm -hmm. and make use of it get the interaction and get them involved. It would be exploring spaces in other areas for creative work. You could explore what is the idea of this creation, myth of this deity which makes humans on the pottery wheel and you will find the mud and the pottery still around. And you could see what is the nylometer which was able to measure all this natural force of the Nile that was going on and which created the culture which we're currently living in. Thank you.